Mezda's Edgefield Bowl, the black and white landscape of the B.F. Landrum pottery site. Edgefield District, South Carolina, located on the southwest border of South Carolina and Georgia, is squarely on the map of Southern decorative arts due to the Landrum family's monumental 19th century pottery production. This legacy could never have been built without the enslaved and free African Americans who provided the labor for this endeavor. The ceramics made in Edgefield range from enigmatic face vessels and beautifully potted water coolers with celadon glaze to massive storage jars incised with poetry and signatures. However, I've chosen to focus this talk on a relatively simple object. A stoneware bowl in the collection of the Museum of Early Southern Decorative Arts, Mezda. The bowl is ubiquitous of the large-scale industrial pottery production that categorized 19th century Edgefield, and for this talk, the Benjamin Franklin, or BF, Landrum pottery site in particular. The bowl measures barely less than a foot in diameter and a mere four inches in height, and fits comfortably into the crook of one's arm when holding it. A closer viewing reveals the intense colors and texture of the glaze applied so thickly that it ran down the outer sides of the bowl during the firing process, resulting in 11 small and rounded glazed drips on which the bowl now sits. With the intense shine and coloring of a polished tiger's eye gemstone, the bowl transcends its utilitarian stoneware origins, revealing the hand of its likely enslaved makers. The story it can tell is far larger than its physical form. It speaks of both the physical and cultural landscape it came from. Using extant objects, documentary evidence, and the archaeological record, and by reading the landscape of clay pits, kiln site, and house site, the full story of this bowl and the 19th century world in which it lived, both black and white, may be more fully known and understood. Let's set the words Edgefield Pottery in context. While the town and county of Edgefield still exist, the county is now a much reduced version of what it was in the 19th century. Robert Mills mapped the Old Edgefield District in 1825, and this is what we refer to as the Edgefield District we discuss today. Three brothers, Reverend John, Dr. Abner, and Amos Landrum, all become stoneware potters in the 1810s and are the patriarchs of the ensuing Landrum pottery dynasty. Dr. Abner Landrum founds Pottersville Stoneware Manufactory in the early part of the century, and it's thought that Reverend John Landrum's pottery is established not long after. You will note that B.F. Landrum is Reverend John's son. Together, John and Abner are believed to have been the first in the American South to invent and use the alkaline glaze that the Southern pottery tradition which springs from Edgefield, is known for. Robert Mills described Abner Landrum's Pottersville, or Landrumsville, as Mills called it, as a, quote, village altogether supported by the manufacture of stoneware carried on by Abner Landrum and which by his discoveries is made much stronger, better, and cheaper than any European or American ware of the same kind." End quote. Mills's description of the village failed to offer much beyond an industrious but pastoral rural enterprise and ignored the stark reality of the enslaved labor of African Americans at the stoneware manufactory. I want to address this gap relying on the recent work of archaeologists, collectors, and historians.
Scholars have documented the use of enslaved and free African and African American laborers within the Edgefield District pottery production, including at B.F. Landrum's Pottery Works. Across numerous Edgefield sites, attention has been paid to the archaeology, to looking at intact pottery from an art historical perspective, to the life of African American potter and poet David Drake, and more recently, important research on the documentary record has been undertaken. But the pottery and sites have not really been looked at as a whole through the lens of material culture. There was this huge operation going on in Edgefield and a huge number of enslaved African Americans involved. What were their lives like? How did they live? And what was the landscape they moved in? The B.F. Landrum Pottery Site in operation roughly between the years 1848 and 1900, is thought to be one of the most well-preserved pottery production sites of the old Edgefield district. Today, it consists of about 150 to 160 acres, which is owned, managed, and protected by the South Carolina Department of Natural Resources Heritage Trust. It includes roads, the remains of the pottery kiln, waster pile, clay pits, as well as the remains of both slave dwellings and B.F. Landrum's house site. I was lucky enough to visit the site of the B.F. Landrum Pottery Works and Homestead this summer with the Mesda class and have since returned with colleagues from the Metropolitan Museum of Art. It is an incredible site and I so wish you could all come there with me. And so I thought it would be fun to take a little trip back there all together during this presentation in a way that won't have your shoes getting nearly as muddy as mine did to explore the landscape of this specific site, the material culture that would have been found on it, and how the Mezda Bowl fits into this story. So imagine that after a bumpy drive, we're with the class traveling by footpath, led by archaeologist Sean Taylor of the Cultural Heritage Trust and researcher Dr. Corbett Toussaint. The B.F. Landrum site was bulldozed in the 20th century, and so while there are no standing structures remaining, recent archaeology has mapped out the site. We walked to what is believed to be the head of B.F. Landrum's kiln. A chimney would have been at one end, near where a tree stands today. And that tree is right here, behind the gentleman, Sean Taylor, in the white shirt. Kiln bricks can still be seen on the ground surface, and a shovel will bring even more up. Exact dimensions of the B.F. Landrum kiln are not known, but from what has been excavated thus far, it is thought to be at least 80 feet in length. That's eight zero. Other Edgefield District kilns that have been excavated are known to be even longer. The excavated kiln at Pottersville is measured at 105 feet long. The style of these partially underground kilns is that of a groundhog kiln, but due to the length of the excavated kilns, the Asian dragon kiln has been suggested as a more likely example. In the image on the screen, you're looking at a sketch of a Chinese dragon kiln on top in comparison to the bottom sketch of the excavated Pottersville kiln, and you can see how similar they are. Amongst the brambles, pottery sherds can be seen on the ground surface near the head of the kiln as can large and small pieces of quartz, which bring the story immediately back to the bowl at Mezda, on which can be seen a small fleck of white. This is quartz trying to break out from the clay during its firing, a visible, physical reminder of the land from which the clay was extracted. Continuing the walk, down the length of the kiln. Larger sherds begin to catch your eye until you realize you are practically standing on what seems like a mountain of broken pottery. And this is the extant waster pile. 
thankfully protected by the South Carolina Department of Natural Resources so that future study and archaeology may take place. It is suddenly as if it is 1850 and the kiln has recently been fired, the broken or unsellable pots thrown into the waster pile. It is believed that 35 to 50,000 gallons of pottery were made each year at each Edgefield district site in the 19th century. So that is a lot of pots. So it's no wonder that so much is left to the trash and thankfully to posterity. And we'll just continue to take a little walk through some of the things we found in the waster pile. We've got some really beautiful glazes here. And then here's what's known as a capacity mark. The three slashes on this piece, meaning that this vessel could hold three gallons when not broken. I found these glaze drips to be so reminiscent of those on the bowl, as well as the colors of some of these other sherds. And then here's a great piece with not one, but three, count them, one, two, three, of the marks known as B.F. Landrum's cross. And then over here, on the piece to the right, you can see what that cross would look like when fully impressed. Continuing the exploration, we'll make our way to what would have been B.F. Landrum's house site. So as you can see on the screen, there's not much there these days, since unfortunately the house was raised in the 1970s. But a 1950 newspaper article described the Landrum house as follows, and I'll let you all use your imagination for just a moment. Quote, 121 years old and has two large main rooms with huge fireplaces and hand-carved mantles. Gray papering with gold fleur-de-lis adorns the walls of these rooms, whose flooring is heavy, wide board. The front porch goes around two sides with high banisters. A front door of enormous dimensions, Roman cross design, has square glass panels on either side and above. A rock wall near the front encloses a garden which overlooks a lawn which slopes down to the brook which flows into Horse Creek. Brick walls were formerly bordered by Narcissi, Jonquils, and Hyacinths." End quote. An overgrown mound in the earth now stands in for the chimney rubble underneath. Although nearly completely taken back by nature, the current landscape speaks to the memories shared by Landrum descendants of beautiful flowers and terraced gardens. Today, black walnut trees abound, as do wildflowers and heaps of wild garlic. Bees were raised in at least one beehive on the property, and the flowers bring to mind a broken flower pot see the drainage hole from the waster pile just earlier. Near the chimney rubble can be found broken glass panes, possibly from windows or the glass paned front door, and whiteware sherds of the late 1800s from plates or large dishes speaking to the objects that once made up this house. It's possible to sketch the interior as it would have been in B.F. Landrum's time. Through the 1889 inventory and estate sale, one of the large main rooms described in the 1950 article would likely have been the parlor and filled with a carpet, a rug, a suite of furniture, and a valuable piano and stool. A kitchen would have held another small table, a cooking stove, a cupboard, a meat cutter, two pots, and a coffee mill. Interestingly, 
A second piano in Piazza is also listed. Perhaps it lived on one side of the front porch to be played by Bia Flandrum's wife, Rebecca, or one of their five daughters on warm summer nights. Bia Flandrum's house site is about a half mile to a mile from the kiln site, which likely would have been the production area with the potting shed and pug mill, an example of which you can see on the screen, nearby. The pastoral and tranquil image that can be painted of his family home is in stark opposition to the production site only a 15 minute walk away, a garden in the midst of an industrial wasteland. And I'll just note that unfortunately I don't have a photograph of what the B.F. Landrum pottery looked like in 1850 or 1860, but the image I have up on the screen right now which is a reconstruction of a pottery in Jingdezhen, China, I think gives at least a decent idea of what a pottery operation with a dragon kiln looked like. The 1860 census tells us that there are three houses for the enslaved owned by B.F. Landrum on his pottery site. One of these is thought to be here due to the crumbling remains of a fallen down chimney archaeology has yet to be undertaken at this site. Notably, this dwelling site is only a brief walk from the kiln. While Landrum's house was farther away, surrounded by crepe myrtles, jonquils, and orange lilies, the slave dwellings were built at the production site. Unlike today, the landscape would have been barren of trees and growth, as great loads of timber would have been needed for the kiln firings. The pottery production site, devoid of greenery, with pits dug for clay and kaolin, would have been a destroyed landscape of labor, inhabited by those same laborers. And who were they? It is well enough to stand at the site in 2019 and say that it would have been a barren wasteland, and that the kiln was likely at least 80 feet long, but that would mean an 1850s reality of someone having to crawl into that dark space, cramped and unable to stand, to place the pots that were ready for firing. In 1840, B.F. Landrum owned four enslaved people, but in the years between 1840 and the next census in 1850, B.F. purchases a number of slaves from his deceased father's estate and then begins his own pottery production by 1848. The 1850 and 1860 slave schedules each list 12 enslaved people owned by B.F. Landrum. Between 1845 and 1861, we know that B.F. Landrum purchased Jeff, Sally, Dave, Simon, Samuel, Yellow Jim, Jim, Axie, America, and Eliza, and her two children. Which brings us to stoneware turner David Drake, possibly the best known Edgefield potter to this day. B.F. Landrum purchased, quote, Dave, unquote, from his father's estate sale in 1847, paying a premium price of $800 for an, quote, excellent stoneware turner, unquote. And this was almost certainly the David Drake, who is known amongst collectors and museums today for both the immense size of his pots, as well as the poetic rhyming couplets he often wrote on them, along with his signature, Dave. So one of the reasons we all love working with objects is that they can tell stories of people who are not otherwise given a voice in the documentary record, which is why there's a great deal of importance to finding fingerprints on bricks in 18th and 19th century Southern contexts because they are most often tangible reminders of the enslaved people who made them. Finding fingerprints on ceramics, particularly those made in Edgefield, is of similar importance. 
This is a visible reminder of agency even during slavery, as is Drake's writing on his turned jars and jugs. And clues to Drake's agency even after the Civil War continue to be found. Let us not forget that Edgefield has an especially violent and bloody history. But before the terrors of the Ku Klux Klan and the Red Shirts fully infiltrated the area during Reconstruction, newly emancipated African Americans took steps to ensure that their skills, so long used for the sole benefit of others, would continue to be of use. An 1866 Freedmen's Bureau contract between B.F. Landrum and six newly emancipated African Americans referred to as, quote, the home Negroes employed in the manufacture of stoneware, end quote, states that B.F. Landrum will give each person a certain number of gallons of stoneware that he will furnish, quote, the wagon and team to carry the ware to Augusta, Georgia, end quote, provide them with rations, and, quote, feed and clothe Jim, Wash, and Adam, boys, for their services, end quote. In exchange, the six adults agree to, quote, do regular and faithful work, end quote, and Simon agrees to, quote, turn what is known as the long day's work, a boy being furnished to assist him, end quote. Three men and three women are named below. Simon, Dave, Sam, Celia, Kitty, and Anne. All six adults leave X as their mark. Notably, the Dave that is listed does not actually sign his name. But could this be David Drake, ensuring that his stoneware work would continue? David Drake is known to have registered to vote a year and a half later, in late August of 1867, in the Edgefield Courthouse election precinct. Could he still have been turning pots nearby, back at the B.F. Landrum site? The slave labor that previously allowed for the massive pottery production of Edgefield District had ceased to exist, and along with it, the industrial scale of the operations, but pottery continued to be fired in the area through the turn of the century. The most recent archaeological report of the site states that Landrum may have sometimes allowed his African-American neighbors to fire their wares in his kiln in these later postbellum years. At least two African-American men are known to have purchased items from B.F. Landrum's estate sale in 1888, furthering the line of thought that these black and white relationships, forged by kiln fire, did not simply disappear after emancipation. Now, the Mez de Bol cannot be definitively dated to any one particular year during the B.F. Landrum pottery operation, nor is there any way at this time to say that the bowl was absolutely made at the B.F. Landrum pottery, beyond the fact that it came into the Mezda collection labeled as such by a dealer when it was gifted by Mezda founder Frank Horton in 1991. The bowl's form shares similarities with ones made in Crawford County, Georgia, but it also shares similarities in form and glaze with sherds found at the B.F. Landrum site where we know both from the archaeology and from period receipts that bowls were regularly being made and sold. Although we cannot definitively say that this bowl came from the B.F. Landrum pottery, or even Edgefield District, it most certainly could have. And even if it did not, it most certainly is still a part of the Southern pottery tra tradition that originated in Edgefield, and spread throughout the South due to westward expansion and itinerant potters. However, the bowl can still tell more of its story, even without this information. When looked at closely, 
one can both see and feel the ridges that build up the bowl's curved sides, and it is possible to feel the movement of the fingers that worked the clay. Whatever its individual story may be, the bowl is a conduit to exploring the landscape of Old Edgefield District, a landscape of work and industry, but also of resistance and emancipation. It is representative of American craftsmanship, originating in Edgefield and completed by oft-forgotten African-American artisans and laborers. I have not even touched on B.F. Landrum's treatment of his slaves working in the jug factory. I haven't told you about the well-documented case of another Anne who hanged herself after Landrum beat her for insolence one morning, or B.F. Sons' violent assault against Nancy, who was tied fast to a large tree while being whipped. These stories, and more, remain to be told. Edgefield's population during the antebellum period consisted of an enslaved labor force that allowed for pottery production on a massive scale, but also a population of skilled craftsmen left in the area post-emancipation who already held the knowledge and experience of this type of pottery production. As interest in Edgefield pottery continues to grow, it is only through fleshing out the stories of place and production that the truth of these objects, objects like the bowl at Mezda, can be revealed. Thank you.